The Nintendo 64 was made by the company Nintendo. The company Nintendo was founded in Kyoto, Japan on September 23, 1889. Nintendo started out by making playing cards by hand. And as they gained more popularity, Nintendo needed more hands to fill the demand. Throughout the next 60 years, Nintendo continued to grow as a playing card company. Throughout the 1960s, Nintendo set up love hotels, had taxi services, and manufactured vacuums. All of these extra ventures by Nintendo failed, besides one new venture, their toys that they had introduced during the 1960s. Gunpei Yokoi, an assembly line worker at Nintendo, had created a toy for fun called the Ultra Hand. It's a scissor-like toy with two suction cups at one end that could extend out by pushing the two handles together. The toy was put into production and became a massive hit in Japan. It sold over a million units, and it took Nintendo out of the financial trouble that it was having at the time. As Yokoi had a background of electrical engineering, and the Ultra Hand being a hit, Nintendo placed Yokoi into product development. This is when other toys like the Love Tester, the Ultra Machine, which is a self-pitching machine that pitched little softballs, came to be. In 1971, Nintendo partnered with Magnavox to create a light gun controller for their video game system, the Magnavox Odyssey. In 1973, Nintendo released the laser clay shooting system inside of bowling alleys. It was a game where the player would shoot a rifle that emitted a laser light onto a projection screen that displayed targets. This laser clay shooting system became such a hit that people would go to the bowling alleys simply to play the game. In 1974, Wild Gunman was released and was much like the clay shooting system. Both of these shooting simulators made it to the European and North American markets, but due to the 1973 oil shortage where plastics were essential need, the games were scarce. Along with the high prices Nintendo charged, they couldn't keep up and the subsidiary of Nintendo who made these games, Nintendo Leisure System Company, closed up by the end of 1974. Within their new employees came Genyo Takeda, who in 1975 designed Nintendo's first arcade game, EVR Race, and would later be one of the lead developers on the Nintendo Wii game console. In 1978, Nintendo's research and development department was split into two facilities to work on different projects simultaneously. In 1979, Nintendo creates a subsidiary company in America in New York City. In 1980, came the handheld game and watch video game series. They used technology from calculators and they became a massive hit. 59 different game and watch games were made, which sold over 43 million units worldwide. In 1981, Shigeru Miyamoto, an artist at Nintendo who had been with the company since 1977, in almost a last minute rush to get Nintendo out of a jam, created a platform based arcade game that let the player control a little man and make him jump as he dodged barrels being thrown by a gorilla. This new arcade game was called Donkey Kong. The little man players would control was named Jump Man, but would later become a character named Mario. Donkey Kong became a success and spun sequels in the coming years. In 1983, the next arcade game was Mario Brothers, where Miyamoto gave Mario a brother named Luigi. Also in 1983, Hishiro Yamauchi, after many thoughts about releasing Nintendo's own video game console, released Nintendo's first gaming console, the Nintendo Famicom, in Japan. In 1985, North America's version of the Famicom, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short, was released. The NES was a huge success. Nintendo's popularity in the mid to late 1980s was red hot. And with the 1990s approaching and technology improving, Nintendo started development on its new system, the next level of video games. The Super Famicom was announced in Japan in 1987. And as the Famicom and the NES ran on an 8-bit processor, this Super NES would run on double the power at 16 bits meaning better graphics, sound, and experience. And looking at other companies such as NEC and Sega, they released their 16-bit systems, TurboGrafx, 
and the Genesis in Japan in 1987 and 1988, respectively. Nintendo took their time, but they did have a fire underneath them to keep up with the competition. This is when in 1988, Nintendo got into an agreement with Sony to create a CD-ROM add-on that would attach to the bottom of the Super Nintendo console. They called this add-on the PlayStation, or the SNES CD. 1989, Nintendo released their first handheld video game system that used dedicated cartridges called the Game Boy. On November 21st, 1990, Nintendo released the Super Famicom in Japan, and it became an instant hit. Once again, Nintendo was the hottest thing, regardless if they were a little late to the 16-bit console game. In 1991, PlayStation, the CD add-on for the Super Nintendo, was set to be announced, but instead, Nintendo announced that they were working with Philips on their video game system, the Philips CDI instead. This caught Sony off guard, as they saw Nintendo letting Philips use their Nintendo properties for their games. The whole background between Nintendo and Sony at this time was that Nintendo secretly cancelled the original contract they had with Sony as they looked over it again and realized that Sony would have much more control over Nintendo with what they could do with this PlayStation. After this, Nintendo wanted to go back into negotiations, but by 1992, Sony cut negotiations with Nintendo. With the PlayStation a bust, the idea of the next console was in Nintendo's heads. They needed a new direction. The Summer CES trade show in Chicago in 1992 saw the use of technology from Silicon Graphics, a company who developed 3D computer-generated effects. At Nintendo's booth, a newly hired man for Nintendo, Charles Martinet, was voicing Mario's 3D modeled head, greeting and talking to visitors as they walked by. Martinet would later become the voice for Mario in Super Mario 64, as well as every Mario game in the future. But at this moment, this was Martinet's first gig. As the attendees only saw a 3D Mario head, Martinet would talk to them in real time with Mario's voice. The headset would also line up with his facial movements. Now in 1992, this technology impressed everyone, and this was the beginning of the partnership between Nintendo and Silicon Graphics. Early 1993, Silicon Graphics was wanting to expand beyond what it was originally doing. What they did originally was make graphic 3D visuals for private companies, along with supercomputing. They were the ones who made the visuals for the dinosaurs in the movie Jurassic Park. What Silicon Graphics wanted to do next was to take their technology and move it into the mass consumer market. Without getting too technical, what they had created was a computer that could use less than half the power of other computers with the same amount of quality. This also meant that the technology would be much less expensive to mass produce. Their first idea was to take this supercomputer box and take it into the video game market and shop it around to different video game companies. The founder of Silicon Graphics, Jim Clark, found himself at his first stop, which was Sega of America. He met with Tom Kalinske, who was the CEO of Sega of America at the time. Tom was amazed with Jim's proposal and was all aboard. But after Sega of Japan heard all about it, they said no to the idea. So this is when Jim, in the early months of 1993, found him at the headquarters of Nintendo of America. After Jim's proposal to Nintendo, Nintendo's CEO at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi, said yes. So the main parts of what Silicon Graphics brought to the table to Nintendo was something that they called Reality Immersion Technology. Nintendo didn't have time to waste as they needed to stay at the top of the video game market. And at this time in 1993, the video game console landscape was changing. Other competitors came out punching. The Atari Jaguar and the 3DO both branded the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis as just toys. On August 23, 1993, at the Shoshinkai trade show in Japan, Nintendo publicly announced that they were working on their next console with development by Silicon Graphics. They introduced Silicon Graphics as Silicon Graphics Industry, or SGI for short, and Nintendo pointed that they had the equipment that developed the special effects from movies like Terminator 2 Judgment Day, 
and the more hit movie at the moment, Jurassic Park. Nintendo called the code name for the new console, Project Reality. With SGI on their team, Nintendo wasn't planning on joining the 32-bit era of consoles. Better yet, passing it and going into the next generation, doubling the bits to 64 instead. Describing the console as enabling players to step inside real-time, three-dimensional worlds. Around the same time Nintendo started developing the Nintendo 64 console, the game Super Mario 64 was in development around the same time. The idea for the game Super Mario 64 started during the development of the Super Nintendo game Star Fox in the early 90s. The creator of Super Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto, came up with the idea to make a 3D Mario game. The Star Fox game on the Super Nintendo used the Super FX chip, which helped it make it into a 3D rail shooting game. Miyamoto's first idea for this 3D Mario game was going to be made for the Super Nintendo. But as the Super Nintendo was being phased out, the idea stuck with him. And as the next generation of Nintendo consoles started, using 3D graphics, Super Mario 64 went into development right away. So the first year of development for Super Mario 64 was spent on the design of the 3D Mario. They worked on how he moved, jumped, crawled, and flew. They had to make sure it felt just right before they decided to do anything else. Nintendo continued in a release statement that they were going to have the technology in arcade games by 1994, and the new console would be out at some point in 1995. Nintendo also added that this new console would be slapped with the sale price of $250. This was much lower than other new 32-bit consoles were priced. In Europe on September 16, 1993, the Amiga CD32 was released, priced at $399. October 4, 1993, the 32-bit 3DO game system was released at a price of $600. On October 27, 1993, Sony announced that they were releasing their very own game console, the PlayStation, featuring 32-bit 3D polygon graphics. Early January 1994, Las Vegas held the Winter CES. Besides showing off the new Super Nintendo and Game Boy releases, anything from Project Reality was non-existent, except for some demonstrations of a 3D New York skyline and a shark swimming in water. As these visuals did impress people, the only takeaway from the show was that Project Reality was still planned to be released in 1995. CDs were becoming the hot new thing that video games were being released on. That wasn't what Nintendo surprisingly had planned for Project Reality. May 5th, 1994, Nintendo announced that their new console would be using cartridges instead of CDs for their games. One of the main reasons for this is that they were trying to combat counterfeiting. But besides that, they also talked about how loading speeds slowed down gameplay and how other competing consoles adding a CD player to their hardware would make the consoles easily more expensive, slapping another $100 onto the price. Nintendo then went to create something that they would call the dream team of video game publishers. This dream team of publishers that Nintendo appointed would work exclusively on the Project Reality console. The companies who made up this dream team, along with Nintendo, were Acclaim, Angel Studios, which would become Rockstar San Diego, Game Tech, Paradigm, Sierra Online, Software Creations, Spectrum Holobyte, Williams Midway, Rare, and DMA Design, who would later turn into Rockstar North, who created the GTA games. The dream team was first tasked to create arcade machines using SGI's technology. Two arcade machines were made. One arcade was developed by Rare and Midway, which became the fighting game Killer Instinct. And the other, from Williams and Midway, was the racing game Cruisin' USA. On June 23, 1994, during the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, Nintendo showed off two Super Nintendo games that was developed using SGI technology. One was developed by DMA Design, called Uniracers, and the other was developed by Rare, called Donkey Kong Country. As Donkey Kong Country stole the show, 
The one other notable announcement from Nintendo was that their new console was being renamed from Project Reality to Nintendo Ultra 64. It seemed like a fitting title based on the names of their earlier game consoles, the NES, the Super NES, and now the Nintendo Ultra 64. As how many bits a game console had meant everything back then, the 64 added on to the end fit well at the time. And at the show behind the scenes, the press were invited to play the two arcade games, Cruising USA and Killer Instinct. After this show and during the summer, Nintendo teamed up with Rambus Inc., which would be working on the 4 megabyte RAM memory and the memory bus for the Ultra 64. August 1994, Acclaim announced a game they were working on for the Ultra 64, a first-person shooter based on the character of Turok, Dinosaur Hunter. September 7th, 1994, after about a year of design, production started for Super Mario 64. October 28th, 1994, the Killer Instinct Arcade was released. And then the next month, November 1994, the Cruisin' USA Arcade was released. Later on in that month, November 22nd, 1994, Sega threw their hat in the ring with their 32-bit system, the Sega Saturn. December 3rd, 1994, the Sony PlayStation was released in Japan. As the prototype console for the Nintendo 64 was being developed, the Project Reality team started working on what this next-gen console's controller would be. Developers for Nintendo who were assigned to work on the controller were directed to break the mold and try new things. They then started with a modified Super Nintendo controller. As many designs of the controller were made with clay forms, test groups were brought in at the beginning and during development to see which designs worked the best. Nintendo made over a hundred prototypes to get the analog stick on the controller just right. The controller had three handles, and it somewhat resembled the letter M. The top of the controller had left and right shoulder buttons, labeled as L and R buttons, and the far left handle had a standard directional pad. Moving to the middle handle, it was rigged to have a Z button on the bottom, which would work as a trigger button. The middle of its face was given a red start button, but the biggest thing that set this controller apart from everything else was the analog thumbstick, giving the player a full 360 degrees of movement within the worlds in the games. Looking at the far right handle, as the games from the system were going to be inside a 3D environment, the controller was given four yellow camera buttons called C buttons. Along with the C buttons, the controller was given a blue A button and a green B button. And last but not least, the controller was given an extension port above the Z button. Although Nintendo wasn't the first to use analog sticks for their consoles, they were the first to have a tiny analog stick built into their controller. During the first six months of development for Super Mario 64, Mario was controlled by a computer keyboard. Genyo Takeda and Shigeru Miyamoto tested playing Super Mario 64 with the controller to get it just right. Super Mario 64 would be the first experience for many gamers controlling a character in a 3D environment. Miyamoto knew this, and there'd be a bit of a challenge for the majority trying to understand where the character is in the 3D space. His solution to this was to put a circular shadow on the ground wherever Mario and other objects were to give the player an idea of depth. The original Ultra 64 controller had a gray and black look to it along with a much larger thumb analog stick. 1995. It was the year everyone was waiting for. January 5th, 1995, SGI stated in a press release that the system's main parts were finished. As Nintendo saw skepticism from the public on the Ultra 64, they announced a few more developers joining the Dream Team in the first quarter of 1995. An ad for the Ultra 64 at the time read, you can't buy this. About to buy a new games machine? Is it worth waiting? Yes. 32-bit CD machines are fine, but they don't cut it where it really counts. They just don't have the power. This does. 64-bit power. Nintendo Ultra 64. The speed of silicon cartridge. Not CD. Slow. You can't buy it yet. After all, 
Nothing this good comes easy. But do you really want something less powerful? Wait for it. May 5th, 1995. At the very first Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3 for short, Nintendo was present. At the show, Nintendo pushed their failing 32-bit 3D portable system named the Virtual Boy. Then Nintendo mentioned that the hardware for Ultra 64 was finished, but they brought the bad news that the release date would be pushed back in Japan, December 1995, and North America into the next year in April of 1996. On August 30th, 1995, as the Ultra 64 was taking longer than expected to be released, Killer Instinct, the arcade game originally slated to be on the Ultra 64, was released on the Super Nintendo on a limited edition black cartridge. November 24th, 1995, at Nintendo's 7th annual Shoshinkai trade show in Japan, it was announced that the Nintendo Ultra 64 was given a new name called Nintendo 64. According to Nintendo, the name change happened because they wanted to have consistent branding worldwide. They also somewhat saw it silly to give every new console that they had an upgraded name, like going from Super to Ultra. The final version of the Nintendo 64 console was on display at this show with a dark gray charcoal color, a power switch on the top left side, a reset button on the top right side, and on the top's back center area, the cartridge slot. The front face of the console had four controller ports and a Nintendo 64 logo faceplate in the center. The original gray controller was revealed for the first time, as many other different color variants of the controller were on display as well. Now the controllers at this time still featured a much larger analog thumbstick than what would become standard later on. There were demos of two playable games for the Nintendo 64 at this show, which was Super Mario 64 and Kirby Ball 64. It was stated that Super Mario 64 was 50% finished. Kirby Ball 64 wound up getting cancelled, but later released as Kirby's Air Ride on the Nintendo GameCube. Previews for upcoming Nintendo 64 games were also shown, like Zelda 64, which showed Link as a more cartoony character as he fought against a knight. Mario Kart R, which was the early title for Mario Kart 64, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire, Blast Dozer, which was later renamed Blast Core, Wave Race 64, which at this time didn't involve jet skis, but more of a futuristic boat-looking racer game, GoldenEye 007, which at the time was an on-rail shooter type game, Star Fox 64, Pilot Wing 64, Body Harvest, and Buggy Boogie. To top it all off, Nintendo mentioned that they were developing the Bulky Drive for release in 1997. The Bulky Drive would later be renamed the 64DD, the DD standing for Disk Drive. The 64DD was a console add-on that was the same size as the Nintendo 64 console. The N64 console would be placed on top of the 64DD, and they'd connect through the N64's bottom side through an expansion port. The 64DD discs weren't exactly discs, but magnetic storage units inside of a flatter gray plastic shell. These games would then be loaded into a front slot of the 64DD. The Nintendo 64 cartridges on their own only had 12 megabytes of storage space, compared to the CD with 650 megabytes. The 64DD games would add an additional 64 megabytes of space, and unlike CDs, N64 cartridges weren't able to run full motion videos and high quality audio within their games like Sony's PlayStation could. The 64DD would give a solution to that problem, giving developers a lot more space to work with, adding higher quality and additional content to games. Nintendo announced that the 64DD would be revealed in late 1996. Two more things were announced at the event. One was a memory card accessory. It was called the controller pack. The controller pack would be inserted into the N64 controller to save data. As most data would be saved onto the game cartridge itself, it was seen as mostly useless, but convenient when backing up customized and in-game items or stats a player achieved. In the final announcement, 
was that the release day for Nintendo 64 was going to be pushed back yet again. Going from December 1st, 1995 to April 21st, 1996 in Japan. It was now 1996. A good handful of developers in Nintendo's Dream Team didn't have the best reputations, and there was very little to no involvement from other Japanese developers. In February, Nintendo saw that most of the games slated for Nintendo 64 weren't ready by their standards, including Super Mario 64. They saw the finish line, but still needed to be polished to live up to the quality and expectations Nintendo had for themselves. Shigeru Miyamoto saw Super Mario 64 as the launch title for the system, and it would make or break the console's success. He wanted to make sure that it was the best that it could be. And in order for that to happen, he requested to delay the N64's launch by two months to put the finishing touches on the game. In March 1996, Nintendo 64's release date was now set for June 23, 1996 in Japan and September 30, 1996 in North America. And in Europe, a release date was set for November in 1996. Around this time, magazine ads for the N64 displayed Mario standing on a globe of Earth as he swung Bowser by his tail. The ad read, On September 30th, dinosaurs will fly. Because on that day, the home entertainment world starts spinning in 64 bits, faster than any video game system or personal computer ever made. Live your dream. Nintendo 64 and its revolutionary 3D controller will send you as far into the game as you dare to go. Over the top, out on the edge, choose your hero, James Bond, Ken Griffey Jr., Super Mario, or even Darth Vader. You'll find them on games exclusive to Nintendo 64. Players will rock. Competitors will weep. Is it worth the wait? Only if you want the best. Nintendo 64. May 16, 1996 kicked off the second annual E3 in Los Angeles, California. This is when the Nintendo 64 was revealed for the first time in North America. The Nintendo 64 was described of having the memory power of transferring 15 Donkey Kong Country games every second. It was announced that the Nintendo 64 would be released on September 30th and would be on sale for $249.95. As Super Mario 64 was the centerpiece game at the event, Many other games, such as Pilot Wing 64 and Wave Race 64, were shown. Designer Ken Lobb mentioned that the prototype cartridge of Super Mario 64 was very tall, but the final version of the cartridge would be half the size. It was at the C3 that they unveiled the Game Boy Pocket, a version of the Game Boy that was 20% smaller with a higher contrast screen. June 23, 1996 the Nintendo 64 was finally released in Japan. The system was sold with the console and one controller for 25,000 yen, or around 218 US dollars. The first N64 games available in Japan were Super Mario 64, Pilot Wing 64, and Seikyo Habu Shogi, which is a board game in Japan that's like the game chess. The first initial 300,000 units of the Nintendo 64 was sold out in its first day. Super Mario 64 was bought almost in a 1 to 1 ratio with the system. Needless to say, the Nintendo 64 was a hit, and it was in high demand. June 26, 1996, Nintendo shipped out 200,000 more consoles, which sold out the same day. Nintendo wanted to create more competition with the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation. So on August 19, 1996, Nintendo announced that the N64 would be priced at $199.99. Not only that, but the N64 would be released one day earlier on September 29th. Subscribers to Nintendo's magazine, Nintendo Power, received a promotional VHS tape showing off the N64. This tape was titled Change the System. So now we're in September of 1996, and the North American release of the Nintendo 64 was days away. Per usual, with any kind of stock, the consoles were sent to retailers in advance before the release date. 
As toy store KB Toys started selling Nintendo 64s ahead of its release date on September 26th, 1996. It was a complete accident as the cause to it was miscommunication between the company's buyers and the actual staff in stores. The staff simply saw the Nintendo 64s in its back rooms and immediately put them up on store shelves. Upon hearing this news, Nintendo basically let all retailers stock the N64 a few days before release. Regardless, given a few days early, September 29th, 1996 saw the official release date of the Nintendo 64 in North America. Two games were available on launch day, Super Mario 64 and Pilot Wings 64. Cruisin' USA was planned as a launch title as well, but it got delayed. Much like in Japan, in North America, the N64 console and Super Mario 64 were sold at almost a 1 to 1 ratio. At the end of summer 1996, a million Nintendo 64s would be shipped throughout Japan. There was one problem. After three months, there was no new games since its release. As Super Mario 64 was great, people seemed to lose faith in the Nintendo 64 as nothing new came out. September 27, 1996 in Japan, the fourth Nintendo 64 game was released, which was Rave Race 64. And during this time, at least in North America, was when the video rental store Blockbuster Video started renting out Nintendo 64 consoles for people to take home and try out. November 22nd through the 24th, 1996, at the Shoshinkai 1996 show in Japan, the N64 disk drive was shown to the public for the first time. As the 64DD wasn't the centerpiece of the show, it didn't play anything new, except a running version of Super Mario 64. The 64DD was set to have a late 1997 release date in Japan. Nintendo focused more on the games coming out, such as Zelda 64, Yoshi's Island 64, later renamed Yoshi's Story, Earthbound 64, and Star Fox 64. Shigeru Miyamoto showed off N64's new accessory, the Jolting Pack which would later be renamed the Rumble Pack. The Rumble Pack is a battery-powered accessory that would be loaded into the back slot of the N64 controller. When playing a game on screen, the Rumble Pack would shake when a player would run a spaceship into a wall or into the ground. Much like in Japan, the Nintendo 64 in North America was also a huge hit, having been either scarce or sold out by the 1996 holiday season. From its launch until the end of the year, between the sales of the console and its games, the N64 was selling $5 million of product daily. By the end of 1996, 10 games had been released in Japan for the N64. In North America, only 8 games were released. In September, we had Super Mario 64 and Pilot Wings 64. November was Wave Race 64, Mortal Kombat Trilogy, Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey, and Killer Instinct Gold. In December was Cruising USA and Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. March 1st, 1997, Nintendo 64 was finally released in Europe and Australia. In Europe, the console was sold at a whopping 250 pounds, way more than any other region. March 14th in Japan, a price cut was given to the N64 to be in line with the North American 149.99 price cut. May 1997, a price cut for the N64 was also given to the European market. The real notable games for half of the year were Mario Kart 64, Blast Core, Turok Dinosaur Hunter, and Doom 64. June 19, 1997 kicked off the third annual E3 event in Atlanta, Georgia. Everyone visiting Nintendo at this event had questions on what was coming to fill the bare library of games they had. Game publisher Rare was represented with games like GoldenEye 007, Conker's Quest, which would later become Conker's Bad Fur Day, and Banjo-Kazooie. The four-person multiplayer from GoldenEye had everybody addicted. The 64DD didn't make a showing at this event, as it didn't have any presentable software to give the DD any attention. Nintendo's Howard Lincoln assured everyone that when the software is ready, the 64DD will be shown off. He also added that a modem would be included into the disk drive as well. 
Nintendo focused more on talking about how, yes, the PlayStation had a lot more games, but here at Nintendo, we focus on quality, not quantity. And then to close everything out at this E3, Nintendo showed off the game Superman 64, and no one seemed too excited about it. June 30th, 1997 hit and shook the system in North America with the release of Star Fox 64. The game included the new accessory, the Rumble Pack. August 25th, 1997, GoldenEye 007 was released. On November 21st through the 24th, 1997, Nintendo hosted its ninth Shoshinkai show in Japan. This is the year when the show was renamed from Shoshinkai to Nintendo Space World. The 64DD's Japanese release date was delayed once again, moving from March 1998 to June 1998. Many new accessories for the Game Boy and Nintendo 64 were revealed, such as the Game Boy Camera, Game Boy Printer, the N64 Transfer Pack, which would be inserted into a controller slot, the N64 Mouse, and a Voice Recognition Unit, or VRU for short. The new Pokemon Gold and Silver games for the Game Boy, which was still in its prototype phase, was presented. Pokemon games for the N64 were announced. Pokemon Stadium, Pokemon Snap, and Hey You Pikachu. The 64DD was presented in detail with what it could do. Its features included an internal clock, larger memory storage space, exclusive games, and the ability to interact with games on cartridges, discs, and other video devices. Showing off the 64DD, Nintendo used Mario Artist, a series of three different programs. These games were the Talent Studio, the Paint Studio, and the Polygon Studio. The Mario Artist series would take advantage of the N64 mouse accessory, as it was seen as the sequel to Mario Paint on the Super Nintendo, which also used a mouse. Showing off the new N64 transfer pack, it could load Pokemon or data from Game Boy games into the Nintendo 64, turning the transferred Pokemon from having 2D to 3D graphics. They also showed off in Mario Studio how they could take photos taken from the Game Boy camera and put them on polygon models. Among all the new gadgets, games were also shown off. Zelda 64 was announced to not be on the 64DD after all, and it would just be put on a regular N64 cartridge. Playable demos of Zelda 64 and F-Zero X were available. Other games were announced and shown, such as 1080 Snowboarding, Earthbound 64, Super Mario RPG 2, and SimCity 64. At this point, PlayStation was churning out games left and right and was just killing it in the video game industry. And so for the first time in history, Nintendo fell to second place in the video game market. By the end of 1997, over a hundred new games were ready to be released in the coming year for the N64, including Donkey Kong Country 64 and a sequel to Super Mario 64. 1998 for Nintendo 64 was dull and slow starting out mostly because PlayStation was picking up even more speed and selling more than the N64. May 28, 1998 kicked off the fourth annual E3 that was held in Atlanta, Georgia. Behind closed doors at this event, Sega was showing off their newest game console, the Dreamcast. A day before the show, Howard Lincoln had announced that the N64 disk drive would not be released in 1998, so at E3 instead, Nintendo showed off Zelda 64, now named The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. After showing off a sneak peek of the game, a screen showing a Triforce read, Link Returns, November 1998, which was then met by loud applause. The games that were shown off at this E3 were Pokemon and Game Boy Camera for the Game Boy, and for the Nintendo 64 there was Hybrid Heaven, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, Shadow Man, South Park, Perfect Dark, Jet Force Gemini, Turok 2, Banjo-Kazooie, Cruisin' World, a sequel to Cruisin' USA, F-Zero, and 12 Tales, Conquer 64, which would end up being Conquer's Bad Fur Day. On top of all that, Nintendo then announced Game Boy Color, which, in the name, was a Game Boy that had a color screen. And then in August 1998 in Japan, 
they saw the debut of a game and a new Nintendo 64 accessory. Pokemon Stadium released, which included the N64 transfer pack to transfer data from Game Boy games into N64 games. On August 25th, 1998, Nintendo 64 prices were lowered to $129.95 in North America. In the fall of 1998, the N64 expansion pack, or RAM pack, was released. The RAM pack was originally made to go along with the 64DD, and as the 64DD's fate at this point was questionable, Nintendo decided that the RAM pack on its own could be used by developers to work with more storage. It would replace the jumper pack inside the top front port. Games like Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Perfect Dark, and Donkey Kong 64 needed the four extra megabytes the RAM pack had to be able to play the whole game. With other games, the RAM pack would enable track editors and racing games, or allow more multiplayer abilities in others. Besides that, in other games, it would also beef up resolution. And then on the other hand, in some games, the RAM pack did nothing at all. And usually around this time of the year, Nintendo would host their Space World show, which would happen in Japan. And this year got cancelled because Nintendo had nothing new to show for the 64DD. December 12, 1998, Hey You Pikachu released in Japan, and it came with the voice recognition unit. This was a microphone that would be plugged into an N64 controller port. This allowed the player to talk to Pikachu inside the game, Hey You Pikachu. And by the end of 1998, Nintendo was working on something new. They knew they had to, as they saw Sega release the Dreamcast in late November of 98 in Japan. Nintendo put together a team to start developing their next generation console. This new console was given different code names like Flipper, N2000, Nintendo Advance, and StarCube. Pairing up with IBM, Nintendo was rushing to be on time, and if not, early in the lineup of the sixth generation of video game consoles. 1998 was the best year sales-wise for the N64, selling 9.42 million in the year. As 1998 closed, Nintendo looked towards 1999 to work on their new console. Early 1999, as Nintendo was focusing more on Project Flipper, they let their licensed characters have games made by third-party developers, such as Rare, Hudson, and HAL Laboratories. May 13th through the 15th, 1999, came the fifth annual E3 that was held in Los Angeles, California. And besides Nintendo, the show was a big one, as every company was showing off what their next-generation console could do. Sega had set a North American release date for its Dreamcast on September 9th, 1999. Sony was showing off what its new PlayStation 2 console could do graphically. And for Nintendo, the announcement came for their new console. Working with IBM and Panasonic, the new console was named Dolphin. Besides announcing the name, they had nothing else to show. But the biggest news that was revealed was that Dolphin's games would be on discs instead of cartridges. Besides the announcement of Dolphin, Nintendo instead focused on their games that they had planned for Nintendo 64. The biggest titles being Pokemon Stadium, Perfect Dark, Mario Golf, Donkey Kong 64, Star Wars Episode I Racer, and Eternal Darkness. In summer of 1999, Nintendo finally announced its 64DD's release date for Japan. They slated the date for December 10th, 1999. August 27th through the 29th, 1999 in Japan was Nintendo's 10th Space World show. The 64DD was the centerpiece at the event, and games announced for the 64DD were Doshin the Giant and Ultimate War. Doshin the Giant became a hit among younger gamers, who would return back every day of the event just to play Doshin. The games announced for the N64 at this event were Paper Mario, Mother 3 or Earthbound 64, and The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. December 1999 came. And in Japan, the 64DD was about to release on the 10th. And almost by tradition now, the 64DD's release was delayed by one day. And it was finally available in Japan on December 11th, 1999. Originally, 10 games were planned to be available for the 64DD's release. In reality, only two titles were available. 
Doshin the Giant, and Mario Artist Paint Studio. So the 64DD was finally released, but it was released in a weird kind of way. Upon its release, it was only available through renting it through a mail order. In Japan, for roughly $28, you could rent the 64DD by mail monthly. Customers who ordered this would get in the mail a starter kit which included the 64DD, an RJ11 cable, the expansion pack, a modem, and a RandNet internet browser disk. Included in this package was the RandNet service, the 64DD's very own online network. Also, if someone wanted to mail order a 64DD, but they didn't have the Nintendo 64, for an extra charge, they would have an N64 console included in the mail. The N64 consoles that were mailed out during this offer had a special transparent black color to them. There was also an offer for an extra charge that you could include a RandNet computer keyboard that would plug right into the Nintendo 64. The plan for this online service was that customers would be sent a new 64DD game every month through the internet. There was yet another problem. On release of the 64DD, the RandNet network wasn't available. Nintendo knew this, but they wanted to keep their promise that they would release the 64DD by the end of 1999. So instead of releasing them full throttle in stores with no online internet network available, they did the mail order thing just to say that they did officially release it in 99. 1999 was a good year for Nintendo 64, selling 7.86 million consoles. Nintendo was optimistic as they had plenty of solid games planned for the N64 in the next year. 2000 was the year of the PlayStation 2's release. And with Sega's Dreamcast being on the market for a few months in North America, the N64 was seen by most as a dying system. On February 23, 2000 in Japan, the RandNet online service for the 64DD was finally up and running. This date also marked the 64DD hitting store shelves in Japan with a sales tag of 335 US dollars. Two more games were released for the disc drive at the time, which was Mario Artist Talent Studio and SimCity 64. The retail version of the 64DD included only the expansion pack and the disc drive itself. March 4, 2000 in Japan, the PlayStation 2 was released. May 11 through the 13th, 2000, the 6th annual E3 was held in Los Angeles. PlayStation 2 stole the show. Then Microsoft showed off its first gaming console, the Xbox. Nintendo, on the other hand, was completely quiet about its next generation console. They only showed off Pokemon Gold and Silver for the Game Boy and new and upcoming games for the N64. The games presented by Nintendo at this event were Perfect Dark, Banjo-Tooie, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Paper Mario, Mario Tennis, Resident Evil Zero, and Dinosaur Planet. August 24 through the 26th, 2000, Nintendo hosted its 11th Space World show in Japan. All the things Nintendo kept from E3, they presented at this show. This is when they revealed their next generation console, the GameCube. On top of that, they also revealed their next generation handheld system, the Game Boy Advance. Along with this announcement was that there would be accessories that could link the GameCube to the Game Boy Advance to load data and unlock exclusive features. Games shown for the GameCube, among others, were Super Smash Bros. Melee, Luigi's Mansion, Metroid Prime, and a demo called Super Mario 128, showing off the GameCube's power. The 128 represented the 128 bits of graphical power the GameCube had. There were more Nintendo 64 games announced, Pokemon Stadium 2, Mario Party 3, Cubivore, and a game called Animal Forest, which would wind up being called Animal Crossing in the West. There were many games that were originally made for the 64DD like Animal Forest, that were now on normal Nintendo 64 cartridges. And given the fact that the 64DD was nowhere in sight at this show, many people considered the disk drive to be dead. And during the year of 2000, Nintendo sold 6.5 million Nintendo 64 consoles. With the GameCube on the rise, 
2001 seemed to be Nintendo 64's final year with Nintendo giving it any amount of push. E3 2001 was on May 17th through the 19th and was held in Los Angeles, California. As Nintendo focused on only their new systems, the N64 was completely out of sight at this event. In August came Nintendo's 12th and final Space World show, where much of the same from E3 happened. All the focus was on the GameCube and Game Boy Advance, no Nintendo 64. September 14th, 2001, Nintendo GameCube was launched in Japan. November 18th, 2001, the Nintendo GameCube is launched in North America. The sales for the Nintendo 64 by the end of 2001 had dropped crazily from the year before, selling only 2.85 million consoles. In 2002, out of all three regions, from Japan to Europe to North America, there was only one release, which was in North America, which was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, which came out August 20th, 2002. And 2002 ended with sales of Nintendo 64 consoles only reaching 500,000 worldwide. And after this, people had moved on to PlayStation 2, Xbox, or GameCube. The Nintendo 64 took its place among the mantle of Nintendo's past gaming consoles, next to the Nintendo Entertainment System and Super Nintendo. The Nintendo 64 is a legendary gaming console, and Sony, an electronics company that had much more money and resources to build a vast library of games in such a short time, the video game industry was taken to another level. With Sony being the cool, flashy newcomer to the market, developers like Square, who made great RPGs, went over to work with Sony instead of Nintendo. So with this, the N64 missed out on a lot of RPGs that Sony was thriving from. Nintendo chose at the beginning to use cartridges instead of CDs for counterfeiting concerns. And so, with the GameCube, they stayed away from the practical, usual size of CDs, and if anybody's ever played a GameCube, yes, the discs are much more smaller. As Nintendo to this day is still in touch with its core roots, being a toy and game company, they have the mentality of quality over quantity. As said in one of the conferences during the N64's run, Nintendo understood that kids would only be able to afford to get one or two games a month. And with that, they took their time to make sure any game available on the Nintendo 64 was up to their quality standards. And I just want to say a little disclaimer here. Uh, Superman? Yeah, they, they kind of missed the mark on that one. I say the Nintendo 64 is legendary because from the rumble pack to the analog thumbsticks on the controllers, the 3D platforming worlds from Super Mario 64, there were so many great ideas that started with this system that we see in video games to this day. Altogether, Nintendo 64 sold 32.9 million consoles worldwide, comparing it to the NES which sold roughly 62 million and the Super Nintendo that sold 49 million. The Nintendo 64 sold a bit less, and some people actually consider it a flop. There are 387 official games that were released for the Nintendo 64 worldwide. 296 of those games were released in North America. And 15,000 Nintendo 64 disc drives were sold in Japan. What happened to the Nintendo 64 after it was phased out in 2002? In a way, it's still breathing to this day. There were some games that were cancelled for the Nintendo 64, but they got ported onto the GameCube. And then there were some Nintendo 64 games that got ported onto the 3DS and the Nintendo DS with special features. For example, Super Mario 64 DS and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D. And then we find ourselves in China. And in China, there was a prohibition on video game consoles, and the reason why was they wanted to keep kids away from being addicted to video games. But as there's a will and a desire to play video games, there's a way. Nintendo wanted to sell in China's market and bring their quality of games to it, but with this prohibition thing going on, they had to figure out a way. So it's 2003, and the Nintendo 64 days are over. So, Nintendo having this large library of great but older games 
They seem to be the perfect thing to sell at a much lower price to the low-income Chinese people. So Nintendo found a loophole in the law, and they paired up with a Chinese-American entrepreneur to develop the IQ, spelled I-Q-U-E. The IQ player was a controller that looks like a classic Xbox controller. The loophole that Nintendo found was that they could sell this legally in China, as there was no box that represented a console involved with the IQ player. It's a plug and play type of system as all the hardware to play all the games were installed inside the controller. On November 17, 2003, the IQ player hit the Chinese market and was sold for $85. And they also released IQ depots placed in certain retail stores throughout China. This is when Chinese players, if they wanted to have a new game, they could take their controller and go up to the IQ Depot and use the flash memory card onto the controller and load their new games onto it. And over the next three years, 14 games were released. During its launch, the first games released for it were Dr. Mario 64, Star Fox 64, Super Mario 64, Wave Race 64, and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Instead of dropping a bunch of games at once, Nintendo wanted to space them out much like they would do any other release for any games. So from December 2003 all the way up to 2006, they released Mario Kart 64, F-Zero X, Yoshi's Story, Paper Mario, Sin and Punishment, Excite Bite 64, Super Smash Bros., Custom Robo, and Animal Crossing. During E3 2005, Nintendo announced that its new console, the Wii, codenamed the Revolution at the time, would have something called the Wii Virtual Console. The Virtual Console would be an online shop people could download games from the libraries of Nintendo's previous titles. December 8th, 2006, the Virtual Console was launched, and one N64 game was available, Super Mario 64. Over the Wii Virtual Console's lifespan from 2006 to 2019, 21 Nintendo 64 games were released. Also during and after the Nintendo 64 was gone, the N64 LogiNet controllers existed. LogiNet was a service inside hotel rooms where specially made Nintendo 64 controllers were installed and connected via phone jack. Navigating with the menu buttons on the LogiNet controller, hotel guests could rent and play N64 games from their TV. The usual charge would be $6.95 per hour, plus tax. 38 N64 games were available to order through the LogiNet, along with games from other Nintendo consoles. And so we are now in the present day. And where's the Nintendo 64 at now, with anything? Well, the console might be gone, and the 64 DDs sell for a lot on eBay. But the games themselves have found a new home. The Nintendo Switch is Nintendo's 8th generation gaming console, and with that, a slew of video games are available to play through their online membership. Up until 2021, Nintendo had original NES games and Super Nintendo games available to play on the online membership. But that all changed on October 25th, 2021, when Nintendo 64 games started popping up on the online membership. With the original membership being only $20 a year, if members paid $50 a year, they would be able to play Nintendo 64 games on their Switch. And with N64 games now being on Nintendo Switch Online, Nintendo also made Nintendo 64 controllers compatible with the Nintendo Switch. With promises of adding new titles as they go on into the future, and that's the history of Nintendo 64.